So I feel obligated to start off with a joke this morning because everybody was going to be disappointed if you didn't get one. And so I, I looked and looked. I didn't want one too funny because then, you know, we know what we're working with normally. But, but you know, it had to be a little bit funny. So uh, I heard this story recently. There's a, a Catholic school, a cafeteria, and the kids are lining up getting ready to go to lunch. And, and uh, all the food's placed out. And the, the nun put a, a card in front of a pile of apples. And it said, only take one. God is watching. And so further down the line, they're, you know, they're walking, walking. There's a big plate full of cookies, and, and the kid thought about it for a little while, and he, he decided to scribble his own little note down there, and it said, uh, take all you want. God's watching the apples. So, so um, sometimes we think that, uh, that God's, you, you know, we kind of shortchange what, what God can do. We think that he's... You know, we try to put him in a box in a way that we can understand things. Uh, but uh, what we're talking about today is that hopefully we can see that God's so much bigger than anything that we can comprehend. Um, and I just want to thank you guys for sticking around, even though you found out probably Brent wasn't here. Because um, you're going, man, yeah, I totally get it. Um, but we appreciate it. Uh, it's, it's great to see everybody here. I wondered when we got up this morning and saw the rain pouring down. I was like, that may be a good thing, but we sure appreciate you guys coming out. Um, Brent and Rhonda and the family are down in Branson. They've been there this week, and and uh, he said they are just having a great time. And just a, they needed a break. They needed some rest. And, and he would never admit that, but man, they pour their heart and souls into this this church. Um, and I don't think we appreciate just how much work goes into that. Um, have you ever seen Brent at Walmart? Have you ever seen how many people he has to stop and talk to just to go get, like, bread? I mean, that's 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 a big job. And we have a lot of baggage that we <laughs> bring, and, and that's normal. But but uh, we just, we're so thankful for him. He is, uh, and Rhonda, they, they just do such an amazing job. Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Mark Schneider, and this is my wife, Jaren, um, my much, much, much better half. And we are... Uh, we are members here at LifePoint Church. We've been coming here since just about the beginning. Um, and we did stumble upon LifePoint by going to buy a car. Um, we went to buy a car and ended up with a church, but it was one of the greatest things that ever happened to us. Um, and we are both teachers in Chillicothe here. Uh, I'm at the high school and Jaren's at Field, and she's got her, her support crew over here, and we're so happy to see them this morning. I'll give you a little shout-out. They even wore their Jaren necklaces this morning, so... We appreciate that. So go ahead, Jer. Okay, let's start off with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we just come to you and we just pour ourselves out. God, these are not our words. Um, you may have used us for this story, but it's not our story. God, we thank you um, just for your faithfulness, the way you pour into us, the way you give us strength when we need it. And God, I, I pray you just take the words, my own words out of my mouth and fill them with your words that what we relay is not at all our own, but it's exactly what you want us to say. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, so let me set the stage for you. You guys are probably wondering why we're here, and we're here to tell you a story. Um, but I don't want you to see our story, because we all have a story, and your story is not much different than ours. Um, it may come in different ways. It may come at different times. But it's all along the same lines. And that's what we want you to see today. And we want you to be able to take away from this. So um, let me set the stage. I was 37 weeks pregnant. Um, Mark and I were headed to Kansas City for a sonogram. I, um, I was measuring three weeks bigger. And that had been for four or five consecutive weeks. So I was getting really close. We didn't know um, what we were having. We were going to wait for a surprise. It was homecoming weekend in um, Savannah. That's where we were living at the time, and so we were super excited to kind of sneak away and go have our sonogram and um, see this baby. So, and we were going to secretly see what we were having. So, um, and not tell anybody, of course. Um, we met with the doctor afterwards. They, after the sonogram, they said, "If you'll just sit right here, um, we need you to see a doctor before you go." And we're sitting there excited. We found out we were having a girl, and um, so we were sitting there. 
and Mark said, we sat and waited, 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 and he said, I don't have a good feeling about this. Really? Because I'm feeling great. Um, so anyway, we finally saw the doctor, and and when we saw her, we knew something something wasn't right. She um, she explained to us that there was, there was lots of water on the brain um, in the sonogram that they could see of um, our little girl, but she couldn't tell us anything more. She didn't know anymore. She said, we just know there's a lot of water, but we don't we don't know why. We don't know what's caused it. We don't know what's going to happen. So anyway, when we left there, we were like air knocked out of us, you know. Um, and it was at that time God was like pressing down on me. We felt broken, of course, and he was just saying, pray. You need to just halt right in your tracks and pray for your marriage, which doesn't make sense because we're talking about a baby. And so we got out to the car, and um, I said, Mark, we just got to pray for our marriage. And at that point, we just stopped and we prayed because we knew whatever this was, God was there with us, and he was going to use it somehow. Now, I want to take you back just a little bit before this all took place. When I first met Jaren and I first visited her house up in Maryville, uh, where, we were both, where we both went to school, um, Painted on the wall where she was living with some other girls. Uh, Brent talked about Proverbs last week, but it was Proverbs 31, verse 10. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies? And let me tell you, uh, through this experience, what I found is that there is so much truth in that. Um, when you and your spouse are both kind of on the same page with your relationship with Christ, um, you know, that that having that person there to depend on is, is such a crucial thing. Um, so any young gentlemen in here that are, you know, still at that stage in your life, find yourself a good girl. <laughs> okay? And girls, wait for a good guy to come along. So, how do people manage going through suffering without a big view of God? Kind of like what Carrie was talking about. The same God who created the entire heavens. You know, when this all started, I, I wish we could say that, you know, we were we were really, you know, super Christians in this, but we had the same struggles and the same doubts and fears uh, with all the unknowns as everyone else. In fact, I selfishly, I thought, man, God, we're, we're trying to do what you want us to do. We're Christians. Why, why couldn't you do this to somebody else? You know, why couldn't this, why couldn't this happen to someone else? And then the more I got to thinking about that, this do to an unbeliever? What would something like this do to someone who doesn't have a relationship with God? You know, and I was so convicted by that. I was so convicted because we just, we want to be selfish. Um, we look at life through our own lenses, uh, through our own lens, and, and it gives us, you know, kind of a skewed perspective sometimes. Where do we turn without the knowledge that a sovereign and righteous God is in control? In the mornings, we're usually downstairs talking to the little kids. We teach the, you know, the little kids from, what, preschool to, you know, fifth grade, basically. You know, and it's so cool to tell those old Bible stories like Daniel and the lion's den and David and Goliath and these people that, you know, they relied on God and they saw him do these amazing miracles. And I sometimes think that we just don't realize that that same God still exists and he still reigns up in heaven. Um... Like I said, we, we kind of want to put him in a box. And um, the verse that we're going to be looking at here in just a minute is uh, this, this now it's Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19. And this is towards the end of the, the, uh, the Old Testament. There were some minor prophets there. Um, and basically, to set the stage here of what's going on, it's, it's Jerusalem. Um, things are really, really, really not looking good for God's chosen people. And Habakkuk is a prophet, and he's, he's basically looking up to God, and he knows that bad days are ahead. The Babylonians are getting ready to invade. Um, it looks like, you know, Israel or Jerusalem is going to fall. It's, you know, it's, it's the darkest hour. It's, you know, the darkest, deepest despair. They haven't seen God. God's waiting. He's holding back. Uh, and he hasn't acted in a while. And, and Habakkuk, he says, though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vine. Though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, 
yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The Sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. So the first takeaway that we're going to have today that I want you to see is that God prepares you for the trials that you're going to face. God prepares you for trials. Okay, so um, preparing us for this news that we got, um, looking back, of course, when you go to different things and you do different things, you don't necessarily think about them helping you out or relating onto later parts of your life. But um, during that summer, right before Ayla was born, um, we actually attended a funeral of a good friend who had a brain tumor. And through that, our little three-year-old, Nora, um, Dad started talking with her, and she we didn't we didn't have anybody to watch her that night. She had to go with us to the visitation. So that just kind of already started planting in her little mind what sadness is, and what um, that God is bigger than sadness. He he's there with us, and he can heal people. He can take that away. Um, so that was just good to open up conversation to start preparing her little three year old mind that. Um, Maybe this baby in mommy's tummy wasn't going to be as perfect as we thought. So um, another scenario, when we were going through premarital counseling, um, the pastor said, you know, he was just throwing out scenarios, and he said, what would you guys do? What would your marriage look like if, if something happened to a child or there was something wrong with a child? And so at the time, we threw out, of course, we, we trust on God. Little did we know we were about to be tested. Yeah, and I remember being so proud that I came up with the right Sunday school answer when he asked that question. I was like, well, you know, we don't have any promises for this lifetime. But, you know, um, when it really hits and you, you're really facing that situation and you have to really live that out, it's a completely different you know, perspective. It, those words just don't roll off of your tongue quite so easily. Um, so we looked at Habakkuk here, and as I said, there, it's this dark time, and it's, it's a difficult time, and they know that um, their holy land, their promised land, they're about to lose, and they're saying, where is God? What is he doing? Um, and we said that God prepares you for trials, um, that he not only allows things to happen in our lives, but he can ordain them for our own good. There's a lot of question and a lot of, of of misunderstanding about, well, where do these bad things come from? Does God know that those bad things are going to happen? Does God create those bad things to happen? And I can't tell you that I have every answer for that. Um, but what I will tell you is that He can use anything that has happened in your life. God does not get surprised by anything. Where does all of the difficulty and hardship and terrible stuff in our lives come from? Well, unfortunately, we live in a world that's been tarnished, that's been broken, that's been messed up because of sin, because of human choices that took place long, long ago when Adam and Eve first, you know, went against what God asked them to do. But before this invasion, Habakkuk was at the lowest low. And the imagery in the verse, he talks about, um, you, know, you know, nothing is where it's supposed to be. There's no grapes on the vines. There's, you know, there's no food. The crops fail. Um, and it makes me think of, of, you know, some of you in here today, you make your livelihood off of um, the earth. You farm. And, you know, maybe times like this when we get all this rain and, this, you know, this, the weather and it's just not cooperating, man, I feel for those of you that are, that are in that line of work because we take it for granted that, you know, that food's just going to be there. You know, that stuff's going to be there for us. And, and my job's going to be there. There's always going to be kids that need to go to school. And, you know, we have that kind of security. And we take things for granted. And, and there is so much. We don't realize that God provides every little thing that gets us by each day. And the next verse we're going to look at is Romans 8.28. And I know a lot of us probably know that that verse. And we can, we can probably say that from memory. And it says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, 
who have been called according to his purpose. Now, it doesn't say some things. It doesn't say that some things work for the good. It says all things. So what does Paul mean here when he says all things? That means all of our afflictions, all of our trials, all the persecutions, all the calamities to which we are exposed. Um, even if they don't stop, if they're numerous and, and they continue and continue, that they're still going to be there for our welfare. Well, how do they work for good? They cooperate. They mutually contribute to our good. They, they teach us the truth about how we're frail and our lives are short and that we're just human beings. In other words, it knocks us down a notch a little bit when we start to feel a little bit too... Uh, too comfortable and too too good about ourselves. They lead us to look to God for support. That's the whole purpose of these trials and these difficulties. And they lead us to look to heaven because that's where our final home is going to be. Because this is not it. And that's really good news. Okay, The longer I live on this earth, the more I realize this is great that this is not our home. Um, it gives us a subdued spirit, a humble temper, a patient and tender and kind disposition. And this is something that every saint and every disciple in the Bible has gone through. They all face persecution, trials, suffering. So how do we rejoice in trials without that understanding of the fact that God is so magnificent and so huge and so in control? And the first thing that I would tell you to do is if you're in that situation and you're, you're like where we were at that point, is the best thing that you can do is surround yourself with godly people. And I mean, we were so blessed in this area. We just had people. I mean, we, we didn't even get home from the hospital and get a house full of people there. And you know, not everyone has that. I mean, that's a, just a blessing from God to have this incredible family and this incredible support system of friends and Christians that were right there at our side. Um, so what I would encourage you to do is find people that can be your counsel and that you can talk to and lean on. And we're going to talk more about that here in a little bit. So takeaway point number two, trials are not optional. Darn. <laughs> don't we wish we could just pull ourselves out and go, mm, I'm good on this one, God. Thank you, but I'm, I don't want that. Okay, so that was a Friday. We had to wait till Monday to get a, a level two sonogram, which we're like, okay, level two, we're going to get some answers. Some of you are probably in the medical field. Level two only means that a doctor does the sonogram. It's the exact same sonogram machine. <laughs> okay, so here we go Monday, and the doctor says the same thing. I don't know what this is, but there's a lot of water on the brain. Okay, so... We wait from Monday until Thursday. Finally, on Thursday, um, I had an MRI at Children's Mercy. They were able to get me in, um, and they checked the brain activity. So from that, there was lots of waiting. When I went home, we didn't have any answers still, um, but my family came over, and they prayed over me, and we were just praying for a miracle. God can do it. We just have to count on it. And so um, at that point, Nora actually started backing away from me, which was kind of weird. She thought something was wrong with me. And so that took some time to just stop and explain, no, Mama's going to be okay. Something may not be okay with the baby, though. And um, so to have those people pray over me, oh, my goodness. Um, it was just, it was awesome. And like I say, at that point, we were just praying a miracle because our God can do it. So. So like Darren said, unfortunately, it's not a question of if we're going to face suffering. It's a question of when. Um, maybe some of you haven't hit that point yet if you're you know, younger, but I know that for a fact that a lot of us in this room have faced things that I can't even fathom. Um, so it's going to happen at some point in our life, and we've got to understand, well, what is, like we said, what's the purpose of that? But I want you to know this. When we face these situations... We all kind of deal with them a little bit differently. For Jaren, she wanted to be surrounded by people. She wanted people, she wanted people to love on her and talk to her and talk her through things. And, and for me, it was like, i got to get out. i got to get away. I've got to process this. And so I went to the quietest place I could find. I went up into a deer stand. 
and I sat for several hours at a time, and I just sat there, and I said, God, you know, what did, what's this going to be? You know, there were so many questions. You know, is this little girl going to be in a wheelchair for the rest of her life? Is she going to be in a vegetative state? Um, you know, and then you start to think about all this stuff, like how are we going to take care of her? How are we going to do, you know, take care of her? How are we going to afford it? How are we going to do all this stuff? And and I got this message from, from God, and, and it wasn't, you know, something that I physically heard, but he was just laying on my heart, you need to learn that you can't control this. There are things in life, it's shocking, it's hard to learn sometimes, that we cannot control. And sometimes God has to teach us that, that all I could really do at that point was just trust and just just wait and be patient and just and 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 just say, I give it to you. And man, some of us really, really struggle with learning that lesson, and I am definitely one of them. Um, but there was a closeness with God there that I can't express to you. And, and what I want to talk to you about is why is it that in these times we are so close to God? Why is it that when the floor drops out, that that's when we hear from him so closely? C.S. Lewis, a very famous Christian author that I know a lot of us probably have heard of, he said, pain insists on being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our consciences, but he shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And what that means to me is that that's the time when he wants to communicate with you, when he's trying to tell you something. And, you know, is there anyone alive who hasn't suffered in pain? And, and what he's saying here is what we learn in our pain, we could never learn in our comfort. I travel overseas every so often and go to the Philippines for mission trips, and I'm convinced there that it's much easier for them to, to trust and rely and know God because they have to rely on God for everything from their, their literal daily bread. And we can insulate ourselves with so much stuff, okay, and so many things, and, and this, this idea that we have, you know, control and that we can do it all on ourselves. And I think that when God strips that away from us, that's when we realize, man, we're, you know, you take that away, and we, we don't have anything. James 4, 6, I love the book of James because he just really tells us how it is. It's very convicting. He says, he resists or opposes, this is talking about God, he resists or opposes the proud, but he gives grace only to the humble. And nothing will make you humble more than losing things that you held dear, or, or seeing something that you took pride in just, you know, shatter before your eyes. Um, Paul. We all know that Paul wrote a huge portion of the New Testament. We all know that he was a really, really, really bad guy. He persecuted Christians. He, he was a Jew, and he thought Christianity was horrible, and he literally was there when Stephen was stoned. Um, Paul, in Romans 8, 18, you know, this is after his conversion, he says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For God, uh, for the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not only by its own choice, but by the will of the one who has subjected it in hope that a creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. What that means is that suffering produces children of God who are focused on eternity. I struggle with being focused on eternity. We don't look at things in life from an eternal perspective. Um, unfortunately for Paul, you would think a guy who you know, is going, who God calls and says, Paul, you know, he blinds him on the road and he says, Paul, you're going to be the one that I'm going to choose to, to spread, you know, my church and spread my word. And you would be thinking, you know, God would really take care of Paul. He would just kind of make him, you know, take care of all of his needs and make smooth sailing. And he wouldn't really have to, he's got a lot on his plate. God would want him to be able to focus on that. But, but he didn't do that. God didn't do that for Paul. Um, it doesn't seem fair, but um, the good news was that um, he was chosen to bring the gospel to the Gentiles, the kings and the children of Israel. But the bad news was he was going to suffer many things for Christ's name's sake. And he did. 
And the book of Acts is all about his suffering. And, and it's as Paul says, from the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one, meaning he was literally whipped. Okay? Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep, and journeys often in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Sounds like fun, doesn't it? Literally, to not have clothing, not have food, to be stoned, to be beaten. Well, why did he have to go through all of that? What was the purpose of that? Why would he, you know, God's messenger, have to go through so much difficult circumstances? Well, he also talks about having this thorn in his flesh that we can't really, um, we don't know exactly what it was, um, that was given to me a messenger of Satan to buffet me. If God decided to add all these sufferings to Paul's life, there had to have been a reason for it, right? Because God doesn't make mistakes. It was a, to bring about transformation, to change Paul and to make him into the person that God needed him to be. In other words, it was, a, it was the only way that he could break Paul down in order to be used. And unfortunately... Sometimes we have to have the same process that happens to us. Paul needed intensive spiritual therapy. He was forceful. You know, in his, his human, in the flesh, he was forceful. He was fiery. So God made sure he had plenty of trials that were going to test his patience, that would produce long suffering. He was harsh and he was judge, judgmental. So God made sure he had painful experiences that were going to tenderize him. He had a tendency towards pride and arrogance, so God made sure that his pride was squeezed out of him. You can't have much pride when you don't have clothing, you know, and you don't have a place to sleep. It's, it's hard to be proud in that. Paul understood that God knew what he was doing, and his intentions were good. He knew that all these things would work out for his best, and so, you know what? He took all of that, and he was glad in it, okay? And you know what? After thousands of years of Paul praising God in heaven and experiencing the glory of eternity, do you think he would change any of it? Do you think he looks back on it now and is going, man, that totally wasn't worth it. That was rough, you know? No, because with, you know, through all that time, you know, that looks like such a moment, momentary, difficult thing. You know, he did suffer, but it was so worth it. Okay, and it was so necessary in order for him to become the guy that God needed him to be. So, um, and John Piper, another really in incredible Christian, said, Walking through suffering helps us experience the realness of Scripture. Okay? So we can't know what that suffering is like for people in the Bible unless we've also experienced it. It makes it real to us. So the third point here is it's okay to be perplexed. It's okay to just go, I don't get it. Okay. So we received a call from the MRI at Children's Mercy, and the MRI showed little brain activity. Talk about perplexed. <laughs> um, it not only said little brain activity, but also they saw that a mass had formed um, right above the brain stem, what looked, what appeared to be a tumor-like mass. Um, we had to wait a week to meet with a team of doctors for them to explain further. So again, more wait time, which felt like years, but it was also time that we couldn't do anything else. We were just paralyzed. Um, so it was time that we spent a lot of time with God. And you know what? He's quiet a lot. <laughs> I wanted a big flashing sign saying, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. He didn't send it. Um, but we knew he was there. And and I think whenever he's quiet, that's when we seek harder and we seek harder to find him because he is there always. Um, they said they had never seen anything like this before. And they had no idea what the birth was going to look like. Um, so again, we're running on no answers. God's the only one that knows what's going to happen. Um, our biggest prayer was that it wasn't something genetic, 
because we wanted to have more kids. Also, our prayer was um, if it was something that we had done that we wouldn't we wouldn't find out. Like God just put blinders on because we don't want to live with that blame. We don't want to put something between our marriage too. So um, we were perplexed as we thought about going dress shopping for a baby that we didn't know she would survive. Perplexed as we wrote a birthing plan. Do we want to lock up hair? Do we want to um, to be res- resuscitated? Things like that. That we're going. Okay, God, this is awful. This, we don't like this. Um. Also, if I can see through the tears. Whew, um. Our prayers turn from God, show us a miracle, to we want your will. Like Mark said. Is this little girl going to be born and be in a wheelchair her entire life? Is, um, you know, what's to come for this little girl? So we went from, and that's a hard thing to do. And I had people handing me books on, um, written by authors that their children had passed away. And that's perplexed right there because I was just like, no, God, but I want a miracle. But through it all, you have to know, we have to know that God's will is what we truly want. And that's what's truly going to be the best. So your suffering may not look like ours. Some here do. We've got two people and two women in this church that I just know of who are now really, really good friends who went through suffering almost identical to ours. But your suffering may not look like that. But you need to know God's will is going to ultimately prevail and ultimately that's what we want. Though we may not be able to see that plan. So, going off of this idea that it's okay to be perplexed, what I want you to know is when you're suffering through something, when you're experiencing something like this, you don't have to put this fake mask of of, of happiness on your face. Uh, and that's what we try to do. We try to cover it up. You know, we don't want anyone to, to know. We don't want anybody to see the hurt. Um, but I don't think that that's what God wants us to do because that's why we have a church family. That's why we have, you know, brothers and sisters in Christ, okay? Um, It's it's okay to question, you know, how is this going to bring you glory, God? Um, But the truth is that God uses tragedy to set the stage for triumph. We just see a small piece of the picture. It's like looking at a couple pieces of a puzzle and thinking that you know what it's going to be, and then it turns out being something completely different, completely beautiful. Um, The Lord delights in showing us triumph through suffering. And I can't promise that everyone's story, I wish I could, is going to, you know, show triumph on this earth in this lifetime. I cannot promise you that. But what you will see is that someday it's all going to be made new and it's all going to be beautiful. And, you know, all those those last final tears are going to be shed. Um, If you know someone who's going through suffering, maybe you're not in that stage right now, but some things that, that I would suggest maybe to not say because this is kind of, this is just good practical knowledge. Some, some things to do when someone's suffering, you, you want to say something. You want to you wanna put wrap it up in a little bow and help fix the problem. But um, some things that you shouldn't do. You know, when Job had all this happen to him in the Old Testament and everything was taken away, his friends, what did they say to him? They were like, what did you do wrong? You know, what did you do? Okay? Doesn't help doesn't help very much. Um, the next one. Uh, sometimes we want to say, well, God, God's going to do something. God will use this. And and yes, we know that's true. Um, and that is, it, it's somewhat comforting, but um, it's not really, it doesn't help you feel better in the moment, really. You know, you, what you really want is somebody that's just going to put their arm around you and just say, we love you. Okay. And we're going to be here for you. Um, I know, I'm, I'm moving, I'm moving. Uh, don't say God is seeking to teach you. Um, don't think of someone else's story who had it worse and, and tell that story. Again, it doesn't really help, okay? Um, so, as a church, here's what our job is, okay? And we are very, very blessed that we have an amazing group of people who have come together and, and are you know willing to, to carry that burden with you. Um, but we can't have mandatory happiness as soon as we walk in this door. And we want to smile and we want to laugh and we want to be happy when we come in here. And that's great because, you know, we're new creations.
creations in Christ, and we want to see other people experience that same thing. But if we know someone is going through something difficult and is hurting, we can't just ignore that. Okay? We've got to be there to 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 support each other. That's that's what our our role is as a church. We must recognize and acknowledge that that some people are hurting. And Francis talked about this before. Some of you here can see people who are hurting. You can recognize it just by looking around. That's an amazing spiritual gift that God has given you, and you, you need to use that. You have been blessed with the ability to comfort other people in their times of struggle, and you've got to, to be led by the Spirit and His prompting in, in, in that, um, because it's a hugely important job, okay? And, and if you're suffering, okay, let someone know, okay? You've got to talk with someone. Again, find those people that are going to be your support system. So the fourth point is our faith is rooted in suffering. Okay, It is ingrained. You can't separate one from the other. Suffering is in there. Okay, so Ayla was born, Ayla Faith, our little girl, was born November 5th. She was 8 pounds, 7 ounces. Because of my health, I was able to have her at Children's Mercy, which was a huge blessing because we were never separated. When she was born, she wasn't breathing. They did go ahead and resuscitate her. Um, she did pick up, but at that point, the doctors were still saying, we, we don't know how long she's going to live. So they asked Mark, "Do you what's, what are some wishes for you? So at that point, Mark thought really well. <laughs> I would not have. He said, can our mom... <laughs> He said, can our mom um, hold Ayla while she's still living? And so at that point, they brought um, back, when they rolled me out of my C-section, there was my entire family, my parents, Mark's parents, um, our pastor at the time, my childhood pastor, and my brother were all garbed up. And we've got a picture of them loving on um, little Miss Ayla. The entire group, or the entire time was touch and go. Um, as they rolled me out, I noticed on the wall lined were just the doctors and nurses, and they were helpless. Can you imagine being in that job every day where there's nothing they could do? Um, so that's my mom and Mark's mom. Um, after three hours, we got to see her. We got to have tons of pictures. The pictures you see of her, she is actually a alive. We, um, God hooked us up with a photographer. Through, I mean, there's tons of blessings, you guys, throughout that we just had to sit down and see them. We had to open up our eyes and go, okay, what, what could have not, I mean, we could have had no pictures of her if I would have had her and we hadn't known. We wouldn't have gotten any time with her. Um, we got her for three hours. After three hours, it was just um, Mark and I sitting in my hospital bed with her, and he said, Ayla, we're going to be okay. Jesus is waiting for you. And she went to see Jesus at that point. Yeah. Um, it was, it was a, a peaceful, wonderful thing. Um, another thing I want you to know is don't ever believe that Jesus isn't sympathetic. Okay? If there was another person who knew something about suffering, it's our Savior. Um, and don't believe that he isn't right along your side crying with you, okay? Um, he's there, and he sees it, and he experience it, experiences it with you, and he feels it. Um, in Hebrews, it says, For this reason, we had to, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. So he as a human experience, all of these things too. Um, and just, I want to just kind of close out with a little bit of, of a story. Um, Carrie and the, the praise team played that amazing song, you know, It Is Well With My Soul. And maybe we don't, I, I didn't know how cool the story was about that song. In 1881, this guy named Horatio Spafford, he was a lawyer and a devout Presbyterian church elder. They were living comfortably with their four young daughters in Chicago. In that year, the great fire broke out and devastated the entire city. The entire city burnt to the ground. So two years later, the family decided to go on a vacation with friends in Europe. And at the last moment, uh, he was detained by business. And so he sent his family on. He says, you guys go on. The girls went ahead. They're sailing on this ocean liner. Um, and it was 
is rammed midship by a British, British vessel, vessel, and it sank within minutes. And Anna, his wife, was picked up unconscious on a floating piece of debris, but the four children had drowned. She was picked up by this crew of this other vessel, and she sent a cable to uh, her husband nine days after the shipwreck. Um, and the cable said, Saved alone, what shall I do? After receiving Anna's telegram, Horatio immediately left Chicago to bring his, own, his wife home. On the Atlantic crossing, the captain of the ship called Horatio to his cabin to tell him that they were passing over the spot where his four daughters had perished. He wrote to Rachel, his wife's half-sister, On Thursday, last we passed over the spot where she went down in mid-ocean. The water's three miles deep, but I do not think of our dear ones there. They are safe, folded, the dear lambs. And on that spot, Horatio wrote that song that we sang today, that hymn. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot Thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Man, that's hard to believe that you could think that, that you could feel that. Um, but I promise you that there will be a day, no matter what you're struggling with, that you will be able to say, it's, it's well with my soul. Okay. So, a lot of you are thinking, thanks for bringing me in and making me cry this morning. That's not what we're here to do. And the last point, suffering requires the right response. So we're dealt with suffering. It's, it's not an option. So what do we do with that? Um, Mark and I could not have, we obviously couldn't change anything with Ayla's situation. We just had to um, trust God. And oh my goodness, has he not um, shown us his goodness in it? There's so many, I mean, I know that we've missed things sitting down and writing of ways that he worked, and he showed us. You guys, he doesn't have to show us how he's working and um, ways that he's making good out, out of something so awful. But that was such a huge prayer of ours was, okay, God, we know you, you allowed this to happen for your good. Please show us some of it. And um, through that... I got to talk with all of my nurses and doctors that came in. I had one nurse at a time at Children's Mercy. You only have one. So with every single nurse, almost all of them stayed in my room for like 40 to 45 minutes at some point on their shift. And we got to talk about Jesus. Like, that's good stuff. I, it was good for my soul. Um, like I say, the photographer, it, we weren't originally. We had a photographer set up, and she ended up walking in the door right after Ayla passed away. Um, but God already had that photographer lined up, ready to go. Um, my aunt came to know Christ again by praying for Ayla. Um, so I know she's good to go now. Like, she was one that we had prayed for for years, and we just hoped that she knew Christ, but now we know. Um, and the last one I'll mention is that God moved us here. After all of this happened, we lived in Savannah, and, um, And God moved us back here. Now, guys, there were times where we were kicking rocks and spitting and just mad because, you know, we can't, it's just human nature is to go through things. We didn't go through this entire thing beautifully, well put together. No. There were some ugly times. And that's okay because, you know, when we have that relationship with Christ, he allows us to beat on his chest every once in a while. He's okay with that. He can handle it. And um, so when... When Mark said, hey, I, I think we should pray about moving back home. I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm good. I, we just got settled in Savannah. I'm good. But now we're on the other side of it. We've been here a year and almost two years. And we have this. I mean, we get to be a part of Life Point And we get to be part of your family. And we're so thankful for that. And would we change a thing? Absolutely. We'd love to have Ayla here. But it's not God's will. And we're okay with that. Um, so to kind of close things, wrap things up, you do not have to be a superhero when things happen, okay? Um, in fact, we have to do the exact opposite response. We have to say, when I'm weak, that's when you're a strong God. If you're walking around and suffering today, and I know that some of you are, how do you respond to that? Are you 
capable of saying it is well with my soul? Are you still trying to figure out what you're being punished for? Is God trying to use this to bring about change in your life by the only way that will get your attention? Are you at the point where you can no longer continue fighting under your own power? Because your own power is going to fail you every single time. And it can lead to a lifetime of bitterness and anger if you let it. Now, really, really quickly, I want to I want to give you a little update on our family. I want to introduce you to a couple of people. Nora went outside. Is Mac over here? He's downstairs too. We now have a 10-month-old, Mac, and he's in the picture. He's super excited to join our family, obviously. And you know, if it wasn't for all of this. I can tell you Mac wouldn't be here. Um, I really don't think so. I don't think we would have had kids that close together. I, it's just kind of, and so he's a huge blessing, and we are a family of five. It will be a family of five, not on this earth, and we're okay with that. You know, we all go through suffering. Seek somebody out, you guys. That's something God taught us through this, is that we've got to look for people. We've got to help each other. We can't do it by ourselves. God gave us our people so that we can love on each other and get through it together. Can we do it just with our people? No way. We need God too. So if you're hurting, you guys, seek somebody out. Your friends aren't your mind readers. They love you. They want to help you. We, want, we love you. We want to help you. So if you are in suffering today, here's what I would encourage you to do. Again, stop trying to do it on your own. There's only two directions that you guys can turn, guys. You can, you know, stay focused here on the earth, and you can turn bitter, angry, hurt, upset. Or you can turn, and you can just surrender it to Him and get the peace that surpasses all understanding. There's only two stages in this life that we can experience. We're either in the midst of pain and hurting and trouble, or we're in between some of those things, okay? Maybe you're at a point in your life where you're not going through one of those seasons right now. So you know what your job is in that situation? It's to be looking for those who, who need help. Looking for those who need Jesus to come in and save them, okay? Thrust yourself upon God. You cannot do it on your own. I want you to call on your church family, call on your friends, call on the, the, you know, the staff here. They're not mind readers, okay? It's easy to mask our pain on the outside, but we've got to let people know. And just as you are saved by faith, you have to suffer by faith. Faith that someday it's all, all of His glory is going to be revealed, and it's going to be so much greater than anything we can ever understand. Guys, one of my favorite things every day is to come home and hear my daughter come running through the house saying, Dad, I'm so glad you're home. You know, it's so, you know, it's just the most wonderful thing in the entire world. And, you know, someday I'm going to hear that again, you know, from, from Ayla. And she's going to say, I'm so glad you're home. And, man, that's going to be so amazing. And that's what I live for. That's what I go for every single day. That's what we're, we're focused on. Guys, don't don't keep it inside. Don't lay all of your, your hopes and dreams and goals in this lifetime on this earth. We're gonna be standing in the back today as, as we play as the band plays that song. And guys, we just wanna we just wanna be here to pray with you. You know, maybe today is a day where you wanna just say, God, I'm tired of trying to do it on my own. I I can't do it anymore. I just I've reached the end of what I can do. Come talk with us. Come pray with us. If we're busy, if you don't want to do it in front of this entire you know, room of people, write your name down. Give us a note. Come talk to us. And, and we want to talk with you. We want to visit with you. We want to be here for you because that's that's what our job is. You know, and most importantly, we want to pray for you and we want to talk. You know, we want to tell you about the good news that we we all can have. Okay? And that's that a precious Savior died on the cross for you, for you individually. And that He knew your entire story.